Well, good morning and grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's begin with a word of prayer uh, as we start. Father, God, and Almighty Lord, we come before you. We're so thankful for your grace and for your mercy that brings us together as your people. And we pray by your grace and mercy that you will be with us as we open your truth this morning, as we look and see who you say we are, Father, and uh, that we don't allow that to be determined by other voices that so ardently want to present that to us. And so we pray that you will bless us this morning and be with us in those efforts. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. You know, it was about a year or so ago when I decided to begin investigating our family history. And I, I had never done that before, but there were a lot of tools that, that promised to help in that effort. And, and so I decided to put in that information and, and, and figure out what I could find. And in the course of events, I, I found quite a few interesting things about our family that I, I didn't know before. For example, found out that we've had a relative fight in almost every major American battle going all the way back to the Revolutionary War. It was very interesting to me. I found out I had relatives that were buried in Arlington, close relatives that were buried in Arlington. I, I didn't know that. Found out that we had relatives that were Native American. Found a lot of interesting things out. Maybe you've done something like that before as well. That's become very popular to look up your genealogy, look up your family history. I remember telling my, my great grandmother that this was something I was interested in and, and, and hoping to maybe get a little bit more information on our family. And, and she said, oh, oh, oh. She goes, well, I have a little something that can help you uh, in those efforts. I said, oh, okay, that's great. And then she went back to her room and she brought out this little something. <laughs> And um, this was a genealogy that one of our relatives, I can barely hold this thing up with one hand, uh, our, one of our relatives several years ago had uh, taken some time to extensively look into the history of only one branch of our family, one side of our family. And what I began to realize as I was reading through that history and what I came to accept was that I'm related to everyone in the world, you know. <laughs> or at least everyone in America. Um, maybe that's something you've done before. As I mentioned, you've, you've looked up your history. We're determined not simply by who we are, but by who others have been. We often determine our identity by our history. But sadly, a lot of us this morning probably wouldn't use that type of language when it comes to our past and when it comes to our history. We wouldn't say necessarily that our identity is determined by our history. We maybe would say that we're held captive to our history. We're held captive to our past. We live in the constant guilt of things that we've done to others, actions that we've done. Or maybe we live in fear of things that have been done to us. We're victims and we're victimizers. And we betray that captivity of the past by asking questions like, how can I possibly forgive them? Or maybe even more telling and more personal, more difficult. How can I possibly forgive myself? And we don't handle the past very well. We try and deny it, we, we try and, and run from it, we try and relegate it to the back corner, that, 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 didn't, that didn't really happen. But the reality is, is that we have to face who we have been before we can become who we must be. Who we have been must be confronted before we can become who we want to be. And, and, and a lot of times we'll say, well, we need to learn from our past. And that's very true. There's a lot of wisdom in that. But the Christian response to our past goes far deeper than simply looking at it and learning from it. In fact, the Christian response to our past is about a God who redeems what is broken and reshapes who we were so that we can be who He says we are. And so this morning, we're going to continue a series that 
we started a few weeks ago called Who God Says You Are. And this morning we're going to look at your past. And, and as we mentioned before, this series is about having a substantive and holistic Christian identity. This is about having an identity that's shaped by Jesus Christ and not by the influence and the effects of those who are around us. And so, this morning I want to give you a key thought and we'll kind of flesh that out together a little bit. And that key thought is this. That salvation, salvation is a transformation of who you were without Christ to who you are in Christ. Salvation is a transformation of who you were without Christ to who you are in Christ. And so let's talk about that for a moment. Russell, I think I'm going to need your help a little bit this morning with the, with the slides here. Thank you. Have you ever had that moment where you have grabbed what you thought was a regular marker or a regular pen? Maybe you thought it was a dry erase marker. And you go to mark on something and then you suddenly realize that it's a permanent marker. Have you ever had that moment happen? I know I've had that moment happen. And if you have kids, you soon discover that they write on anything and everything. Whether it's their walls, the, the toys, their clothes. They write on anything and everything. And you, you, you try and get that stain out. And it, but it doesn't matter sometimes what kind of cleaning solution you use. It doesn't matter what kind of... Uh, if you use the magic eraser. It doesn't matter. It just will not come out. So we say, well, it's ruined, right? It's ruined. That's the language that we, that we use. Well, sometimes it feels like our past is kind of written in permanent marker. And it, it doesn't matter how much we try and, and get over it, how much we try and look past it. When we look at all the brokenness and the struggle and the hurt and the pain that's there. And we say, it's ruined. It's ruined. The message of the gospel is that God looks at all of our past and all of our brokenness and all of our guilt and all of our sin and He doesn't say ruined. He says redeemed. Redeemed. Because salvation is a transformation of who you were without Christ to who you are in Christ. But living that out, believing that, coming to, to truly understand that, is much more difficult said than done. It, it, it's easier said than done, if, if that's even possible, because even saying it, living that out and understanding that through Christ our past is redeemed, and not ruin. That's difficult. But, but, but here's the encouraging part. Jesus gave us a tangible example. A tangible person to show the transforming power of God's saving grace over our past. And his name is Paul. Paul had a difficult past. Paul was a Christian wrangler. And the language that Luke uses in Acts chapter 9 and verse 1 to describe the type of life that Paul was living was that he was breathing out threats and murderings against Jesus and his disciples, against those who followed Christ. That is, he's inhaling hate, he's breathing out murders is the kind of language that, that Luke uses there. Paul hated Christians. He, he hated those who followed Jesus. He hated everything about Jesus. But that wasn't the end of the story, as you well know. After Jesus encountered Paul and commissioned him to go to the Gentile nations, he wrote a letter to a young man named Timothy. And in that, he talked about his past in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. He said this, he said, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. Because He judged me faithful, appointing me to His service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me 
with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the Lord, into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Christ Jesus might display His perfect patience as an example to those who would believe on Him to eternal life. I want you to notice that Paul says that he believed that his life was an example, notice, of the perfect patience of Jesus Christ. What's he mean by that? It's as if Paul is telling them, you have guilt. You have fears. You have skeletons in your closet. You have regrets. So do I. But Jesus is greater than the ghost of your past. How is that possible? How, how is it possible that Jesus can take a man who hated him and turn him into the most successful disciple and apostle of Jesus Christ that we've ever seen? I think we see that answer in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 8 through 10. Here, Paul is writing about the appearances of Jesus Christ. He says, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. It was not I, but the grace of God that works within me. Notice that phrase. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, this isn't Paul resigning to sin or allowing his past to be the determining factor in his identity. He, he, this isn't Paul raising his hands and saying, listen, this is just who I am and you've got to accept that. That's not what Paul's saying here. Rather, he's recognizing the transformative power of God's grace that through the gospel, Paul's past became conquered ground. That the guilt of what he had done to others, the fear of what he had, had been done to him was conquered through the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And so he's looking at his past, he's looking at everything that Paul did and all the guilt that is there, and he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I'm only here, he says, by God's grace. Brethren, this isn't about turning a blind eye to the past and running away from it. But it's about truthfully looking at who we are and allowing ourselves not to be determined by our past, but to be determined by the God who loves us and gave Himself for us. Who, who loved us even in our sin. He demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, Romans 5 and verse 8. In all of this, this transformation and this redemption of the past is at the heart of the gospel. This is what the gospel is about. Notice what Paul would say in Colossians when he's writing to the church there in Colossians 2 and verse 20. Look at the language he uses. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world. Why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulation? You've died to the world. He continues in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated, see, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Why? For you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ and God. 
When Christ, now notice this, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Paul's talking to the Colossians. He says, who you are is no longer determined by who you used to be. Your life now is more than that. Your life is now determined by Christ Jesus, and that's including your past. It's very similar language to what he says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. That's a murderer talking. And he says, I'm, it's not me anymore. Christ has conquered my past. In Ephesians, Paul will often highlight who the Ephesians used to be with who they are now. For example, and we won't look at all these passages, but just as a few examples in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, you were children of wrath, but now you're the workmanship of Christ. In verses 11 through 13 of that same chapter, you were separated from Christ, strangers to the promises, now you've been brought near. In verse 19, you were strangers and aliens, now you're fellow citizens and members of the household of God. Chapter 5 and verse 8, you were darkness, but now you're light. This is who you were, and this is who you now are, because remember, salvation is a transformation of who you were without Christ to who you are in Christ. Within the cross of Christ, Jesus crucifies the past. All of the guilt and the fear and the hate and the anger that comes from our sin, all of that is done away with through the unimaginable grace that's lavished upon us in Jesus. This, of course, is the language that's used to talk about baptism. In Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, he talks about putting the old man to death. We're baptized into the death of Christ so that we arise to walk in newness of life. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And as one person said, conversion, conversion is an autobiographical revision. I like that. Conversion is an autobiographical revision. And suddenly, through the gospel and within Christ, our ruined past becomes a redeemed one. And scars become beauty marks. Now, the gospel doesn't make us forget. We'd like that, wouldn't we? If when we were baptized and that, that, that we would just kind of have a sudden amnesia of the things that we wish that we could forget that we've done to other people and other people have done to us, we'd like that. The gospel, though, doesn't make us forget. But it does make us forgiven. It forgives and redeems the brokenness of the past. And what this does is that it empowers us to see ourselves in all of our brokenness and to accept who we are, not because we're perfect, but because He is. And brethren, that is so freeing. Especially when you have a day when those old regrets come popping up. You ever have that day? That's not a good day. <laughs> when, you're, when you're thinking about all of a sudden these bad things that you've done and it seems like just constantly one after another they just keep coming up and you, you can't help but focus on them. And, and, and all of a sudden you forget that you're a Christian now. And you have to refocus and you have to remember I'm not... I, that's not me. That's not the determining fact. I'm not, I'm not Jacob who is arrogant and prideful and, and filled with lust. I, I'm Jacob who is loved by God. Who God gave Himself for. Who I'm in a covenant relationship with now through the Gospel. And I don't live that way anymore. 
And it's so freeing to know that that love isn't based on ignorance, but God's love for me is based on an extensive knowledge of who I am. Do you realize that? Sometimes we think that we're going to surprise God with our sins, right? Like, like that's how we act. Like all of a sudden God's going to be like, whoa, whoa, I, I didn't know you did that. You know, I, I'm sorry, I can't love someone that's done that. God looks at you knowing all of the sins that you knowing every secret sin that you've hidden from your spouse. Knowing every lie and deceit that you've told. Knowing every darkness that you've tried to hide within the darkest, farthest reaches of your mind. He knows all of that. He has extensive knowledge of who you are. He knows the very hairs of your head. And He says, I love that person. I gave myself for that person. And so often we try and kind of fight off that love, whether we realize it or not. Try and fight off that love. And, and it's, it's hard for us to live out that. That's why Paul prays that the Ephesians would know the love of Christ. Know, know the, the, the dimensions of the love of Christ, he prays in Ephesians chapter 1. And we fight off that love because we're looking at our past and we're saying, God, can't you see... Can't you see what I've done? And God's putting forth the cross and He's saying, Can't you see what I've done? Can't you see what I've done for you? To wipe away that past and to remember it no more. And that's why the greatest conversion stories are the ones with the darkest backstories. That's why we love Paul. And what happens is that the past that we're so ashamed of, and we have so much difficulty getting over, suddenly becomes a story where God's grace and God's love and God's glory are most clearly seen. And so Christians talk like this. This is who I used to be. But let me tell you what Jesus made out of me. That's the speech of conversion. Because salvation is about who you were without Jesus. A transformation of who you were without Jesus to who you are in Jesus. Many of you know the story of Joseph within the Old Testament. He was hated by his brothers, sold into slavery, falsely accused by his master's wife, imprisoned, and then of course the story ends with him being at the right hand of Pharaoh. Later on in life, Joseph had a son, and he named him Manasseh. The name Manasseh means cause to forget. His reasoning for that is found in Genesis chapter 41 and verse 51, in which he says, For God has made me forget all of my hardships. Now here's the irony in this. In saying that God has made me forget all of my hardships, he's showing that he actually remembers the hardships. So he's not saying that all of a sudden he just has no memory of them. Joseph isn't denying the hardships. But he recognizes that the God who redeemed them was far greater than the hardships. That it was grace, not guilt or grief, which would be the determining factor in who he would be and who his son would be. He was saying the legacy of Joseph wasn't going to be determined by that. But the sad reality is that there are so many Christians that are living enslaved to their past. 
That they're so focused on how bad they are that they can't see how good God is. They constantly are focusing on their terrible decisions, their selfishness, or the things that they've committed by others or against them. And as long as you live in the fear and in the guilt of the past, you can never fully embrace the abundant life that Christ has for you. And I don't mean that harshly. I'm saying that because I love you. And I've struggled with that as well. And, and we all struggle with that. Now this isn't a license for sin. Like I said, when, when, when Paul's saying, by the grace of God I am what I am, he's not saying, yes, I get to live however I want to live. No, we, because of God accepting us and loving us, even in our sin, we turn away from sin and we want to live a more sanctified and holy life for Him. That's what repentance is about. The reality is, is that God loves you this morning, knowing everything about you. And if you will respond and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can live within the sweet promise of Revelation 21 and verse 5. Behold, God says, I am making all things new. Are you going to allow your past to determine who you are? To be held captive by that? Or are you going to allow God to redeem the brokenness? To buy you back? To shower you in His love and His grace? And to transform you more fully into the image of His Son? If you're willing to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning, or if you need the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ, why don't you come as together we stand and as we sing.